Hello. Good morning. We're Hello back. Again. Yes, we're back again. So, Meng, there is a study that's super fascinating. It was quite engrossing to read it. It was the first time that I read a study of that nature, and I don't know if there are similar studies on the topic. In economics, I do know that there is one academic, Barton, I think his name is, I've interviewed him, but he's from Europe. His name is Jerg Barton. So Jerg, you should, if you're not familiar with Jerg's research, you should definitely read it. Jerg likes to chronicle cognitive ability across centuries. He's not a psychologist and economist, but Jerg's research is really good. And your study complements Jerg's research. Your study was chronicling the deep roots of IQ gaps. What's that yes. about? But it, it uses a, a method used by Jorg, uh, Jorg Burton to estimate the cognitive abilities of a proxy, at least of cognitive abilities, for uh, people around the world um, one, 100, 200 years ago by using age heaping techniques. Yeah. So the age heaping techniques is basically um, the propensity of giving a number, of age number that is either five or zero. And you can calculate uh, the proportion of people who give these numbers as so for the age as an approximation. And from here, this, using this proportion, you can calculate the Cohen's D gap in uh, cognitive ability. Again, it's a very approximative um, measure of cognitive abilities, and it works only for historical data because nowadays um, we have reached a ceiling effect and it doesn't work anymore. So what Jorg and Jorg Burton and the others showed in their papers is that these age heaping techniques is quite good at predicting uh, socioeconomic outcomes uh, between countries within countries. So we use this technique to estimate the black white gap in the United States. And we did the same for Canada recently and uh, Nova Scotia. Yes. And it's called the deep roots of admixture. I read it like several along earlier this year. And the conclusion is that IQ gaps are not recent. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but I want you to delve deeper into the study because it's super interesting. So, comment more on some of the intricacies. Um, I would say uh, personally because uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything John first uh, wrote in his article. Um, we both wrote or uh, separate um, parts and sections. He didn't seem to like what I wrote, so this was not shown in the published article, but I believe there might be some, maybe some issues with the classification of race in historical data. The way the census classified uh, black people, for example, the classification of people uh, with admixture, for example, the, the what they call the mulattoes, that is, uh, people from both white and uh, black descent, African descent. Those are called mulattoes at the day, uh, at the time. So the way it was classified for me was a little bit weird. For example, if I remember correctly, um, one report said that if you believe there is any trait in, your, in the face of this person, even if he is showing a white face, you can classify it as a mulatto if the, the nose, for example, resembles that of a, a black person or something like this. And it's quite a, approximate. And the classification seemed to have changed a little bit across the years. 
So comparability, I wouldn't say it's not possible. It's possible, but it's very approximative. You see? Yeah, it's the study is titled Deep Roots of Administer Related Cognitive Differences in the USA. Yes, so let me just read a part of it. Second, we use the 1850 to 1930 US censuses to see if we can trace ancestral associated cognitive differences back to the 19th and early 20th century by taking advantage of early census distinctions by blood and also by using age heaping based numeracy as a proxy for cognitive ability. In the 19th and early 20th century, European admixture was associated with numeracy among African Americans and Native Americans. I've never seen a study of this type done in this psychological literature. That's why I am belaboring the points enunciated in the article. Ming, we're still on the topic of IQ. When you discover the world of IQ, it's hard to stop researching and writing. It can be addictive. Some years ago, maybe around 2022 or 2019, you wrote a paper on black men and social mobility. Uh, black. Yeah. black men, yes, African-American men and social mobility. Why are they less likely to experience social mobility? Uh, well, the short answer would be regression to the mean with respect to yeah. IQ. That's one way to explain this uh, difference. Do, do you know what reason? Again, uh, I don't purely buy this hypothesis, but it has to do with uh, racial discrimination uh, at the la at large. This is the most a common uh, rehashed argument. But we, of we, course, but... it doesn't account for regression to the mean. If you account for regression to the mean, do you still see this uh, discrimination effect? This is the question. But by now, we should all know that that's a dumb argument. The major companies in America are investing in affirmative action programs for blacks, especially black women. And black women, according to the Shetty study, they out earn white women. But black men with a similar socioeconomic background don't do as well as white men for many factors. For example, they're more likely to be implicated in criminal activities. Black, black men even controlling for socioeconomic status are still more likely to be shot and killed. Why? It could be due to network effects. Maybe they're involved in criminal activities or their friends are criminals. And as a result, they fall into the trap and end up being shot and killed. But we know that the discrimination argument isn't so plausible. I would say um, the main problem I see with the discrimination argument is that they don't really try to analyze the impact of uh, genetic factors. For example, I would like to see a study that measure the effect of latent discrimination after controlling for all possible genetic effects related to either cognitive ability or psychological factors and behavioral traits, and et cetera. Well, you could do that study. Yes, approximately, yes. Yeah, you, 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 you're you a smart guy, man. You have a high IQ. We, we didn't, <laughs> we couldn't include every possible um, environmental effects. We were just able, for example, to include um, measures such as state discrimination, but the self-reported discrimination lacks validity, for example, or maybe it was state 
discrimination as well. I think both had problems. They didn't correlate much with any outcome measures. So we don't really know if these variables are really well measured. Maybe it is, maybe not. Okay, because, Ming. So are, are, Ming, are you Ming, well measured? Yes? Ming, are you are you referring to a paper that you wrote? Yes, with uh, John first. Okay, and and not the deep not the deep roots of admixture paper. No, it's the, not related. To this one. It's another. Oh, this one. is that the one with Emil Kierkegaard. Income and education are affected by European ancestry. Something yeah, to that effect. Yes. yes. Okay, you can continue. Yeah, I read that paper. One. Yeah, I read that paper. You can continue talking about it. Oh, so yes. Um... Uh, my point is that let's say we have a very well measured uh, discrimination measures. It doesn't necessarily mean it will correlate with the measures of income education. Maybe it will, but the correlation may not be very strong. So we found a weak correlation with our main variables of interest with respect to state discrimination and self-perceived discrimination. But I don't think uh, it's a lack of validity and predictive power means that they are not well measured. This paper is titled Income and Education Disparities Track Genetic Ancestry. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the name of, of, of the paper. Ming, back to Jerk Button, because Jerk Button has a paper on the East Asian numerical advantage. So in that paper, he comment, compared the European advantage and the East Asian European advantage and concluded that both regions for the euro were relatively intelligent in mathematics. It's a, it was a good, it's a really good study it was done years ago, but I would love to see a study looking at the cognitive abilities of Africans in the early modern era. Jerk Barton has a paper on the cognitive abilities of Africans and Europeans, but that paper was analyzing Europeans in a colonial context. So it, it was comparing Europeans in somewhere in Africa during the 19th centuries, comparing them to Blacks. That, that, that was the nature of the study. I would love to see a study on the cognitive abilities of people in pre-colonial Africa. Jerk Barton, again, has a paper on African elites and numeracy, and he mentioned that Economically, Ethiopia was on par with Eastern Europe, but that's just one paper. I would love to see a broader analysis. Because if IQ gaps are not recent, this would provide ammunition for the hereditary explanation. Yes, well, I agree. Uh, I think this kind of research is important and worth it. Yes, and what's even more interesting is pre-colonial human capital of the elite because elites build societies. So we can use the human capital of the elite as a proxy for cognitive ability. And if the study shows that there were great variations in the human capital of pre-colonial elites and these variations are still consistent, then obviously environmental explanations are weak. Yeah, so that's probably the safest conclusion. Yeah, because East, East Asians modernized, Africans did not. Why did East Asians modernize, yet Africans did not? East Asians, they have a history of bureaucracies, literacy, mathematics, and scholarship. The best places in Africa, like Benin, Dayomi, and Asante, they were 
more successful than average, but literacy was not widespread in those societies. So pre even in the pre-colonial era, some person have a problem using the term pre-colonial, but even in that era, we observe great disparities in ability and societal complexity. Another interesting correlate of success is individualism. Have you ever read the literature on individualism? Indeed. Individualism. Oh. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah, you should, you should definitely, you should definitely do some research on individualism. It correlates robustly with a litany of social outcomes, even philanthropy. So, what, what are you working on at the moment? Um, I'm working on uh, Hispanic white gaps and okay. gender gaps as well. Gender gaps as well. Hispanic. So, and these are going to be new studies. Yes, because the problem I see is that uh, I'm not saying I'm not interested in black white IQ gaps, but uh, I'm kind of a little bit tired of it. Exactly, I am too. Because because I think uh, I think uh, the conclusion is already quite convincing and strong. The reason I keep going on and on is because people keep saying the researchers keep saying, uh, "No, it's uh, it's irrelevant. It's wrong. Uh, that's not true. This is erroneous." But another way to convince uh, researchers of the likelihood of the hereditarian hypothesis is to study other groups, such exactly. as Hispanics. And Hispanic group is understudied. I know, for example, there is one uh, important study by uh, Jason Rishvin, Rishvin, I think this is how it's called, uh, his dissertation, and it showed that there is uh, no bias against uh, Hispanics in terms of cognitive abilities. And it shows that uh, there is a great um, proportion of Hispanics that scored below the white and substantially much lower. So I want to study this more because I have enough data to make uh, multiple studies on psychometric bias. Yes. See if this is biased against um, Hispanics and whites. And I have multiple data on different cores and I can see whether or not the gaps between Hispanics and white decrease over time. Because I've done so for the black-white IQ gap, other researchers have done so as well, but we have yet to see um, a meta-analysis on the Hispanic-white IQ gap over time. Yes, and I want to see more comparisons between European and Asian scores. European and East Asian scores. Yeah, the, 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 the focus on the black white IQ gap is really getting tiresome. <laughs> the, the problem I see with uh, Asian samples so far uh, is that um, there is a large difference in sample sizes. The relative sample pick of white and Asia is so large that uh, if I want to fit a Latin variable approach model, uh, the difference in sample size makes the method not very um, reliable. reliable. It's difficult to trust these um, estimates. So if I want to analyze the white Asian, uh, Asian gap, I would use the ACT scores because it contains enough uh, samples of both groups. But the problem with SAT score is that although it is a very good correlate and proxy for cognitive ability, unlike IQ, um, the um, SAT score usually, um, you know, subject to training because a lot of people train and try to practice to get higher score and some even, try to cheat. Uh, we have probably read this 
in the United States some uh, allegations of cheating, especially from the Asian uh, from the Asian communities. They seem to be more likely to cheat to get higher scores. Yes, you're right. So the Atlantic comparability of the scores between groups. Of course, I don't think the cheating allegations really uh, matter too much because let's say the Asians are so much more likely to cheat than other groups, it will definitely uh, create a disparity, a discrepancy in the predictive power of SAT scores. In other words, the SAT scores will not correlate um, similarly with education achievement and uh, socioeconomic status, occupation titles, and income. But what the research show, and this is true across the years, the predictive power of SAT scores is similar for whites, Hispanic, Asians, and uh, Blacks. Very yes. similar. Well, I just I was just about to say that according to the Atlantic, Chinese, they do cheat. So we're just giving some evidence. This is not a stereotype. But then most stereotypes, according to stereotype accuracy literature, they are true. But even if Asian cheat, that wouldn't vitiate vichy the basis of the, the IQ gap because, again, there is occupational segregation. The higher the G-loading of the profession, the lower the probability of Blacks being employed in that profession. Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the cheating wouldn't really rebut anything. To, it, that's, it's a problem if people cheat, but that doesn't undercut the argument that the, the gap is genetic. But there, there are IQ gaps around the world. There are IQ gaps between Southern and Northern Italian, Southern and Northern people in Spain, Southern and Northern Japanese people. So you could be a pioneer in this regard, like Richard Lynn. I am a big Richard Lynn fan. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't care what people say about this data. I've been studying and reading Richard Lynn like forever. That's why I'm interested in IQ because of Richard Lynn. Without Richard Lynn, I would not be writing on IQ. Yeah, so Richard Lynn really has interesting takes and studies. Uh, typically, I mean, the, the problem with uh, Richard Lynn is just that he might be a little bit inconsistent in reporting the numbers. But what's uh, what maybe maybe some memory issues? But the critics try to attack Lynn. Um, uh, Vociferously, just <laughs> based on misreporting, but it's no. obviously. Random misreporting. No, but the problem with the critics of Lynn is that they're not making their case. Like, I have read the literature, and the literature is in favor of Lynn. So, people complain about his IQ data. Russell Warren, the World Bank, and others have corroborated Lynn's findings on low IQ scores in Africa. Cold winters, people love to complain about cold winters, yes, yes, but they don't provide an alternative. And the interesting part of the story is that speculatively, there are more studies that support cold winters than those that do not. So there is this recent study by somebody called Peterson, and he's not affiliated to Richard Lynn in any way. And his study is not even on intelligence, but his conclusion is that Colder climates select for bigger brains and peer bonding. A Richard Lynn idea. <laughs> yes, I mean, theoretically, it makes sense. Exactly my point. Like, Richard Lynn's critics are not proposing alternatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, and that's, that's my issue with the environmentalists. They're not giving us high quality research. Even when even they keep rushing the same adoption study. So there is adoption study saying that adopted children are smarter. And I read it and they was like, well, adoption increases IQ by what? Two points, two to five points. This is consistent with literature. 
that's what the environment does. Like you have a study on adoption and mathematical ability, right? Oh yes, yes. I, yeah. I remember the one. Yeah, like I I rem I remember all of these studies because the onus is higher on people like myself, even though it shouldn't be, because within any population, distributions are the norm. They're not the exception. Abilities exist on a spectrum. But because of political correctness, higher standards are imposed on people like myself to prove arguments when it should really be our opponents who ought to be marshalling quality evidence because they are proposing a thesis that's, that is that's statistically implausible. I think this is the best argument in favor of the hereditary explanation. Is it feasible for us to assume that gaps should not exist. In any population, there will be disparities. So why do people ex expect gaps to not exist? And based on what we know about genetics, the revolution genetics, is it practical to think that these gaps are environmental? It, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't yeah. make, make any sense. And I see that. See, you're shaking your head. So, where, where are you from I would exactly? Say the, the main fallacy of the environmental hypothesis is that it assumes if if environmental are equal, there would be no difference in any characteristic whatsoever between races, and we should all be the same. But that's not true. No, there are differences in self control time preference, financial literacy, psychopathy, individualism. Black Americans are the least financially literate group in America. Yeah, you, 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 you can't be, I keep repeating the point on this show, but there is no scope for capital formation when you're going to eat the profits of the business. And this is an African problem, conspicuous consumption. It is such a problem that mainstream econo economists have published quantitative pieces on this solidarity tax in Africa. That's what they call it. When people become wealthy and that's such, they, they, well, they don't resort to it. It is expected that they're going to feed others. They call it the solidarity tax. You can't build capital in a space like that. It's almost impro it's improbable. But I was going to ask you a question. So where are you from exactly? Where I am from? Yes. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, uh, I'm... You're from Japan, China, so Korea. That's... I'm... Uh, I'm Chinese who was born in France. Okay. And I will soon go back to Hong Kong. Okay. And what are your, do you have a PhD? Mm, no. Okay. What did you study in school? Uh, many things. Uh, first was, maybe that will surprise you, but I initially start, started to study fine arts. Wow. <laughs> that has nothing to do with economics. Then I went out to study a lot of economics. And um, economics, this is at this moment that I learned about uh, HPD uh, topics, human biodiversity, race differences, uh, and such, because I was told, uh, I heard once, someone wrote an interesting article, I didn't know if it was true or not, I thought that was completely rubbish, at the time I didn't believe it at all, for me, uh, Environment is all that matters. I was a 100% environmentalist at the time. So uh, this person said, you know, fighting inequalities makes no sense because inequalities is rooted in race differences. And I said, whoa. So I wrote the article and I found tons of references and I tried to find some 
counter argument, counter ways to these um, hereditary arguments. And the more I tried, and the more I was disappointed by the like myself. hypothesis. <laughs> like myself, like I was an environmentalist too, I thought the idea of genes affecting social outcomes was weird. But I study history, and in studying history, I recognize that racial differences are not recent. And then there was the revolution in GWA studies, and I started to read widely and discovered that the environmental argument doesn't make sense at all, especially considering the reality that working class Asians outperform Blacks. And then there's also the, 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 the other problem in the room that people don't want to address. And this is that consistently Blacks are relative laggards. So in predominantly Black countries, Blacks are, the, are, are at the bottom of the pile. In America, most Blacks are not poor. American Blacks do quite well, but relative to other groups, they are still laggards. So the position of American, of American Blacks is consistent with their global position. Yeah, even in even in the Caribbean, the elite Syrian families didn't migrate to the West Indies with a lot of money. They built wealth over time. So if groups can consistently displace blacks, I don't think that this is because of discrimination. It can be called this this issue is not only genetic, this is also cultural, but then genes influence influence culture. But I ruled out discrimination. When you go to Nigeria, for example, the Igbos, they encounter discrimination, but they are still successful. They are the dominant financial group. In India, the Parsis, they are a minority, but they are still successful. So being a minority group does not automatically mean that one is going to be a laggard. So that's why I switched. I did a complete 180 and started to support the hereditarian movement. But I, I would really love to see those papers on the Hispanic white gap. And he said, I, well, I, I know there's, there's human varieties. You also write a blog, human varieties. Yes. Yeah, I am yeah. one of the contributors. Yeah, one of the contributors. There's a project from 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read their stuff on human varieties. Like, you have a piece on the gender gap. You wrote that, right? On the? The gender pay gap. The, the gender pay gap, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, again, yeah. Uh, I am tired of hearing people um, saying that any disparities between groups, be it um, gender being uh, cultural groups, ethnic race groups, is always due to discrimination. Everything is due to discrimination. If you see a difference in outcome, it must be discrimination. <laughs> this is the, the, the argument that they use. They always use this argument. But when you examine the evidence closely, you see that it falls apart. There are so many different uh, elements and variables that are so much more important than the discrimination effect. And if you account for the other components, the impact of discrimination effect is at best ambiguous, very, very ambiguous. Yes, so this is the same thing that applies to uh, the discrimination against Blacks. Again, at first glance, it makes sense. Okay, it makes sense because uh, self-reported discrimination definitely exists. Sexism exists. We all know this. But if it has an impact on outcomes, socioeconomic outcomes, it will show up in the numbers, in your regression. It will show up in your data, but it's not the case. So if that's not the case, how, how do we trust the discrimination effect? 
No, I, exactly. So I just read a study in the Southern Economic Review saying that Black American men, they actually do better in the South, a place with a legacy of discrimination. So this doesn't conform to the present narrative that discrimination is leading to socioeconomic gaps because the South has a legacy of racism. And involvement in slavery predicts political participation. So there's this female academic who does study on past slave owners and their current legacies in politics. And slavery was primarily in the South. Therefore, if discrimination is a problem, it should be more prevalent in the South. But that's not what the researchers found. So, yeah, more... this is a... Yeah. This is a novel discrepancy that needs to be answered for the discrimination uh, theories. Exactly. So the, the literature keeps showing that discrimination isn't the problem. Look at Nigerian Americans. Nigerian Americans are an educated group. They do well in the United States. However, Nigerian Americans are likely to experience discrimination because of their names and culture. Yet, they're seen as a model group. But, but then again, the better Nigerians migrate. Jamaicans, they have more social capital because Jamaica is a famous country. Bob Marley, you say both. People know Jamaica. So J Jamaican Blacks in the States have more social capital than Nigerian Blacks. Yet, despite the discrimination, Nigerian Blacks are still highly educated. So the plight of Black Americans, that can't be due to discrimination, because even when discrimination exists, it doesn't disproportionately affect a group negatively. So in, in other words, in spite of discrimination, people can still excel. Yeah, so the, the, the argument just don't make any sense. And continue to do what you're doing. Be brave. The good thing about you is that you're not famous yet. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, like I, you, you're, you're not famous, and you don't no, you, you, you don't live in America. That's no. the advantage. Yeah, you don't live in America. You're not an American academic. Like I like Brian Pesta. Like Brian Pesta had written on his ordeal. He wrote his he wrote about his experiences in Quillet magazine. I know Brian Pesta. We correspond occasionally, but yes, he got cancelled because of his research on IQ. And Brian Pesto was doing his, his research for a long time and nobody cared. I don't know what happened. Oh, I remember somebody, they didn't like the fact that he used this sensitive data. That's what happened. And he was, he was yes, cancelled. Yes. I think this is probably also because uh, in the past years, he didn't publish any uh dangerous research it's only in 2020 where i have to go dangerous Make... um research showing that uh the i can Make, Make. Meeting... We, we have to end like i'm running out of time okay no problem yeah but speaking to you has been a a, a pleasure <laughs> bye yes okay. bye